New York is facing a crisis. It's the most densely populated city in America, with 8 million people living in its five boroughs. Perhaps an aerial snapshot is enough to explain the situation. The city is running out of space, and a new challenge has emerged. New York has reached a limit to its vertical development. An average New Yorker spends around $4,000 per month on rent, more than double the current national average. Skyscrapers have stretched the skyline to its engineering and zoning limits, but the demand for space keeps rising. So, what happens when a city can't build any higher? Maybe the answer isn't up, but out. Expanding horizontally could be New York's next frontier. There's a proposal to expand the island of Manhattan 2.5 miles into New York Harbor. The expansion will provide space for affordable housing and also protect the rest of New York in case of a storm. But will this expansion do anything to solve the city's decade-long housing crisis? Or is it just repeating the same cycle of development, pushing the problem further down the line? In 2022, a man named Jason Barr wrote an opinion piece for the New York Times titled, 1,760 Acres. That's how much more of Manhattan we need. Mr. Barr is a professor of economics at Rutgers University, and he proposed to extend the tip of Manhattan. The new region would be called New Manhattan, similar to the indigenous name given to Manhattan Island. The opinion piece was directed at New York's mayor, Eric Adams, and convinced him that this is his chance to create a legacy. For reference, here's the geography of New York. It consists of five boroughs and Manhattan Island is central to the region. As you can see, Manhattan is extremely thin and vertical. That's one of the reasons why it's so crowded. Manhattan is surrounded by three rivers. There's the Hudson River on the west side, the Harlem River to the north, and the East River on the east. If Jason Barr's plan is realized, Manhattan will extend 2.5 miles further, engulfing the governor's island in the process. When Barr's controversial article was published, it broke the internet. After all, it's New York we are talking about. Even a single new subway line can take decades of debate, funding battles, and legal hurdles. So what are the chances of reshaping the entire island? A big part of Barr's defense is that New York has been reclaiming land for the past 400 years. When the Dutch arrived in the early 1600s, Manhattan was a much smaller, marshier island. They settled on the southern tip and began expanding it. Since the island was a low-lying region, and still is, the Dutch built canals to drain the marshlands and erected walls along the shorelines to fill in with new land. The foundation of the modern-day Battery Park and the financial district was made during this very period. Manhattan's expansion continued for decades so that by 1865, the lower tip of Manhattan was some 30% bigger than the original. It created valuable real estate and parks to help the city grow and remain vibrant. So according to Jason L. Barr, his plan isn't as radical as opponents make it seem. After all, New Manhattan is just a 12% addition to Manhattan's land. The extension will feature 180,000 housing units and host 250,000 New Yorkers. And if you have a problem imagining what it would look like, take the example of Manhattan's Upper West Side. This region is the inspiration for Barr's new island. Barr envisions a similar diverse neighborhood containing housing in all shapes and sizes, from traditional brownstones to five-story apartment buildings to high-rise towers, New Manhattan will have everything. The Governor's Island, which will become part of the region, will serve the new Central Park. Barr's plan is to make blocks shorter and even add alleyways to keep trucks off the street. His plan includes six internal parks, beaches and wetlands, and bike paths along the shorelines. He even went as far as to say that cars can be banned from the new island, but taxis and delivery trucks will be given an exception. Until now, we have discussed the fancy part of this project, but now it's time to get real. Let's break down the numbers. How much will this actually cost? Who's paying for it? And most importantly, does the math add up? According to Jason Barr, he's creating a project that pays for itself. He gives an estimated figure of $34 billion for 1,760 acres of land. That's just the cost of creating the artificial land, not the buildings in it. While $34 billion may seem a lot, it's actually nothing compared to the cost of international projects. For example, Hong Kong plans to reclaim 1,700 acres of artificial islands. It's expected to cost $81 billion, far less than Barr's proposal. 
Now we did mention that the island would pay for its own construction. In a nutshell, the profit received from land purchase would be used to fund the construction of buildings within it. Since Barr wrote his article in 2022, he used figures from previous years to explain his mathematics. So if you notice anything wrong, that's because of this reason. In 2019, the average price per square foot was $1,500. Barr took an average of $500 as construction cost per square foot. In this way, the developer will profit $1,000 per square foot. Multiplying this figure by the entire region, New Manhattan will have a market value of $240 billion. This significantly dwarfs the building cost of $34 billion. Land in Manhattan is expensive for this very reason. The sales prices are much higher than the construction costs. The question is, is New Manhattan worth all that trouble? Is New York in such a deep crisis that it needs to create an artificial island to solve its problems? Manhattan's expansion was proposed for two reasons, to provide affordable housing for thousands of residents and to protect the vital areas of Manhattan in case of a storm like Hurricane Sandy. On October 29, 2012, New Yorkers woke up to the worst news of their life. Water is splashing over the seawalls at the tip of lower Manhattan. Just, it's eerie to realize that the whole city has been devastated like this, but there's a hope in the air for sure. And Lower Manhattan was widely impacted since it was on the coastal front line. The seawalls couldn't keep up with the rising water levels, and the whole of Manhattan was flooded. Thousands of residents lost power for days. The subway system was closed, and the New York Stock Exchange was forced to close for two days. 44 New Yorkers lost their lives, and the economic loss piled up to $19 billion. It took years for New York to fully recover from the disaster. Recent studies have indicated that New York is sinking at an alarming rate. The weight of the hundreds of skyscrapers across New York and Manhattan is part of the reason. In case of another storm, areas like Battery Park and Financial District will take the worst hit. This region includes vital buildings like the Stock Exchange, One World Trade Center, and dozens of others. If something was to happen to these buildings, especially the Stock Exchange, the effect would be global. The Financial District is right at the tip of Manhattan. This places it right in the ring of fire, unless, of course, we remove it from the front line. New Manhattan will ensure that the critical infrastructure of New York is safely tucked in. However, when we do this, New Manhattan will become the new target of climate disasters. The idea is not to make it a sacrificial goat for the rest of Manhattan, New Manhattan will be fully equipped to deal with these disasters. Barr proposes to build the new island at a higher elevation for protection. The shorelines would be built with wetlands, beaches, and berms to absorb surges. In the process, Lower Manhattan, the heart and lifeline of New York's $2 trillion economy, would also be protected. After all, it's not just about protecting New York. During weekdays, there's an influx of millions of commuters inside Manhattan. To give you an idea, Manhattan's actual population is 1.6 million. On weekdays, this number swells up to 3.9 million, mostly due to people coming in for work. So from Monday to Friday, millions enter the region from 9 a.m. until about 6 p.m. To counter Manhattan's limited floor space, the region has continued building upwards. The average height of skyscrapers in Manhattan is found to be 738 feet. From commercial towers like J.P. Morgan's HQ, to more traditional ones like the Chrysler Building or Rockefeller Center. Manhattan has everything. It's the heart of America. But lately, that heart has been managing a lot of load. Around the world, cities have responded to the lack of space by creating more land. And as you can guess, it's done by land reclamation. It simply means dumping tons and tons of rock and sand in the seabed and creating an artificial landmass. Arguably, Hong Kong is the Asian master of land reclamation. When the British seized control of Hong Kong Island, they realized that there was relatively little land. Most of the city is rugged mountains with valuable strips along the coast. Today, about 6% of Hong Kong's total area and 25% of developed land is reclaimed. A notable example is the Hong Kong International Airport, built on a large artificial island. This project added nearly 1% to Hong Kong's total surface. Despite that, Hong Kong still suffers from an acute housing shortage. Thousands of people live in the infamous coffin homes. Shockingly, 
these homes have a rent of around 1,000 to 2,000 Hong Kong dollars. That's why the nation is looking to reclaim more land near Lantau Island. Other notable mentions are the man-made islands of Dubai. Dubai has run out of space to fulfill its vision. Utilizing its coast, the country has created an archipelago of three islands, Palm Jumeirah, Dubai Islands, and Palm Jebel Ali. In Europe, the Netherlands is doing the same. In the absence of reclaimed land, 65% of the country would otherwise be underwater during high tides. In fact, the word Netherlands actually literally means lowlands. To this day, the country is actively involved in climate strategies that involve creating beaches, shorelines, and canals to absorb floods. So if all these countries can do that, New York can do it too. But there's more to it than just dumping sand in the harbor. Barr estimates that New Manhattan would need about 170 million cubic yards of sediment. Every year, the United States produces between 200 to 300 million cubic yards of material from port dredging. This is more than enough to fill the requirement of New Manhattan. In this way, the country is recycling its own waste. And this won't be America's first time either. Battery Park City was created from landfill from the excavation site of the World Trade Center and New York City Water Tunnel. On the environmental front, a project like New Manhattan sounds dangerous. Barr's defense is that whether this project goes forward or not, sea level will continue to rise, harbor dredging will continue apace, and the housing crisis will get worse and worse. In his view, New York's inaction is far more dangerous than the effects of this project. According to him, his new island solves two problems at once. However, this plan doesn't take in regard what will happen when New Manhattan runs out of space too. Are we going to reclaim more land to solve the problem? And in any case, Jason Barr is an economist, not an urban planner. We don't mean to discredit everything he's saying, but this is a conversation more suited for the specialists. Anyways, what is your view of Barr's proposal? Will it solve anything or perpetuate the same problem? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. As always, don't forget to subscribe to Sky Builds and press the bell icon for more updates.